Hey everybody and welcome to Let's Look at Volume, the hotly anticipated, I add with uh, a small question mark, uh, successor, or at least second game uh, for commercial release from Mike Bithell. Uh, also, a team surrounding him, but this is a Mike Bithell game as presented. Of course, Thomas was alone as the original. I think it's uh, hotly anticipated that there's been a lot of hype for the game over the past couple of years. I do want to point out in the interest of full disclosure right here from the start, if there was ever a time that you should listen to my full disclosure and take it seriously, this is probably it, because Mike Bithell is probably the closest thing I have to a friend in the development community. I have many acquaintances, uh, which is not bragging, that would be the lamest way to brag of all time, but I have hung out with Mike Bithell, uh, he's been on our show many times, I have met him in person when I was in London for the Paradox event, uh, Kate and I stayed around to do like vacation-y stuff, but on one of those vacation days, we went out and we played volume, uh, with Mike as he was still in development. It was only about two months away from release and we had dinner together So this if this compromises my opinion on volume for you You should maybe watch for the gameplay footage But take everything I say with a grain of salt because we are uh, you know We're not close friends necessarily, but we've we've hung out together on a personal and not a necessarily professional basis um, So that's important disclosure. Okay. I just want you to know everything's on the up and up here. This is not sponsored content or anything like that, he just gave me the review code and said, Hey, you know, play it if you will. But out of interest of being, you know, fully honest here, there you go. Um, Volume is a stealth-based puzzle game, which is probably uh, the easiest way to describe it. And it's one of those games that actually you can describe fairly easily without actually having to jump into it. Basically, we will jump into it, obviously, but um, it is a, a game where it's a, every puzzle is like a self-contained level, or every level is a self-contained puzzle, and uh, you manipulate guards, basically, avoid their vision cones, and make it to the exit as fast as you can. A little bit of a score attack focus, a little bit of a story focus, it kind of has a, a melding of all possible worlds there. How is it? Well, we'll see that as we get along here. I think it is pretty good. I'm a little bit, I don't want to say disappointed, but I think the hype has made it seem perhaps like a little bit more ambitious than it actually ended up being, but on a mechanical level, I actually like the game quite a lot. So we're going to run the simulation here. Like I said, uh, I played, uh, I'm 20% through the story here. I've played maybe, maybe an hour of the Steam version, but another two hours again back in June. So it, it's not like I'm not doing my due diligence on it here. Let's start with a level, uh, we'll start with like the first level post-tutorial so you can get a little bit of an idea for how things look here. I also want to see if I still... Oh no, they fixed it. I used to have like a busted time on one of these levels. I, like my le my score for the first level ended up getting up to the second level and it made it look like I was just some kind of genius. But anyway, um, okay, this is our first real level here. The one thing I really, really like about volume, in fact, I might even call it the, the strongest part of volume. By the way, there's going to be some voice acting here, but um, the, the strongest part of volume, I think, is really the way that it looks. It has kind of like a VR theme to it. I know that Metal Gear Solid uh, and, and VR missions had uh, an influence on the game for sure. Oh, I am an idiot and was spotted already. All right, let's try to manipulate guard behavior to get myself out of this bucket of syrup, and I'm going to die right away, and you're going to see that a lot because... Despite having some okay leaderboard times, that's mostly because I played the puzzle, puzzles before. I'm not particularly strong uh, at stealth games, and this will definitely serve to show that. Don't turn around yet. Don't turn around. Okay, we got it. Um, yeah, I really think the visual elements are really strong. Everything pops. It has a lot of contrast. Uh, it's, it's stylized, but uh, it, it definitely is not just like, you know, style at the expense of... What, what am I trying to say here? Like, it's it's not just stylish to the point that it, it completely defines the game. Uh, but I do think it's probably the strongest element is how cool and diverse the levels look. Not every level has this color scheme, but all the, the levels have color schemes that really pop. So in terms of uh, what we can do here, you're pretty limited. It's a little bit of a minimalistic stealth game, especially in the early uh, parts of the game. A lot of sneaking, no guns, no weapons, no takedowns, at least that I've seen. Uh, but you do get equipment as the game goes on that helps you when it comes to sabotage and subterfuge and stuff like that. Um, we also have environmental things that we can interact with here. So, this guy's on a pattern, it's gonna be very hard for us to get out of his vision cone, but it's probably possible. But if we flush the toilet here, he will get, um, alerted, or at least suspicious, and then he'll come over here. And that gives us a chance to get those gems, gamey gems, and then we will, uh, flush this toilet, and this will allow us to escape. And this is pretty much, uh, this is volume right here. It is a game through and through. We can get spotted, by the way, and still finish the level, but our main objective on every, on every single level is just to finish the level, uh, but you have to get all the gems before you go to the exit. Like, this is very much not like a... In spite of having a story, um, it's very much... Oh, I'm an idiot. Just shoot me. We can also restart with just the Y button here, but I'm using the 360 controller, by the way, but it is available on PS4 as well. Uh, I should learn not to stand there. 
Um, it's it's a game through and through is basically what I am trying to say here. This is not like the the objectives are not abstracted. It's not like you know go into this level and grab the dossier and then escape. Um, you are picking up gems, basically, and then getting to the exit. And in that way, it is is not really that... I don't want to say ambitious, but it's not that... I, the word is just escaping me right here as I'm looking for it. Um, it's a game, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. It's not like a, an experience. It's, it's like, uh, you know, Chip's Challenge taken into the 21st century, I guess, is maybe a way that I would describe it here. Generally speaking, I much prefer when games do have abstracted objectives. I I think it helps tie into the story a little bit, if you have, um... Like, the game does have a story that's told through voice acting, but I think it integrates uh, a story better if you're like, okay, now go, you know, steal the files for this from the CEO's desk or something like that. And after you do it, you get some information that, you know, kind of gives you an artifice for propelling the story forward in that way. What this feels like in volume is a game with a story laid over top of it. And in many ways, that's kind of what Thomas Was Alone was. Uh, the things that you did in the in Thomas Was Alone did tie in with the story, but it was basically a game that was mechanically strong, but succeeded on the grounds of it having like a really strong narrative to go along with it. That's actually like a really good comparison between the two games. There, there's a similarity, a thread that runs between them. Mechanically strong games with a story overlaid over top. I do think the story in volume is a little bit less successful for me personally than the one in um, in Thomas Was Alone. That was kind of cute and quirky and and small. The one in uh, in volume tries to take on a, a modern approach to basically the Robin Hood myth or story, however legend, um, where basically you're playing as Loxley, who is this character that you can see in the background here. He's voiced by, I think his name is Charlie McConnell, but it's Charlie is so cool like on YouTube. Uh, he's a YouTube vlogger, and uh, then there is um, Gisborne, who is like the head of this techno dystopic company, voiced by Andy Serkis, who you may know as like you know Gollum from Lord of the Rings, and he was in King Kong. He does a lot of stuff with Peter Jackson. I'm trying to think of what else he's been in, um, and also Danny Wallace, who was the narrator in in Thomas Was Alone. Uh, plays the role of this AI called Alan that is begrudgingly helping us out through the story. The voice acting performances are all right. I, I, I think they do a pretty good job, but the the story, the way it's told, is somewhat jarring sometimes. Uh, let's get into like some slightly further levels here. It's somewhat jarring sometimes how they just kind of like hit you with exposition and exposition and exposition and exposition. Um, the real strength of the game is not the story, in my opinion. It's actually the mechanics, and that's why I wanted to get into a little bit of a later level here. Uh, by the way, it just it looks so good. Uh, I, I really, really uh, enjoy the visual style of the game. So, uh, previously we didn't really have any other tools except for clinging to walls and kind of moving them around them. Now we have a tool called the Oddity, which I can aim with the, the right analog stick here. And by firing that, didn't work right there, but as soon as this guy turns around, the Oddity basically serves as like a really distracting um, a bobble, might be what I would call it. You know, a trinket or something like that. And you can see that on the top right side of the screen it gets... Um, it gets recharged. It's that meter at the bottom. The meter at the top is the amount of uh, the gems that we picked up on the floor, so that'll go up as time goes on. Uh, so the uh, the oddity distracts the enemies and makes it so that they don't necessarily pay as much attention to you. And, and by that, I mean there's actually like a codified set of like game logic for it. So they actually just pay attention to the oddity, they fixate on it, and sound will not cause them to uh, gravitate towards you or to become alerted to you. Instead, uh... The only thing that will cause them to become alerted to you is actually the, uh, uh, like, vision of you. So I'm going to put the oddity over here. We also have another ability I forgot about, which is the whistle. So by whistling... Oh, I've fudged it up. By whistling, we basically get the enemy to, um... Oh, we did cause him to break uh, vision there. Sometimes you can exploit the AI like that. There's going to be a lot of immersion breaking stuff like that, where you're going to be like, how could that guard possibly not see me, blah, 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 blah. That's that's part of it. You know, again, that's what I mean, that this is not an abstraction for real life. This is a game um, through and through. The enemies def behave in a codified set of ways. But anyway, what I was getting at is we can always use the whistle, and uh, by using the whistle, we can um, we can distract enemies to where we want them to be as well. Uh, there is a focus on, on beating the levels in a certain amount of time, by the way, if that's the kind of thing that you're into. There is like a speed runny type focus. Notice that when we walk on these things that create uh, that radius of sound around us, the enemies don't get alerted to it. Um, and similarly here, we can do something that's that's largely similar. Knowing how large the sound radius is, we can sort of walk on that uh, loud tile when the enemy is not within a certain range. And that will allow us to, to get around that pretty easily. There's a couple of different ways to do this one. 
One way is to use uh, two oddities, which I think is the way that I'm going to choose to do it. Because it's a little simpler that way. The other way to do it would be to like perfectly time uh, the enemy movements. So that you could rush through this a little bit more easily. But I'm not going to sweat that one. And by easily, I don't mean easily. I mean more quickly. Um, similarly, we have puzzles like this uh, that teach you that sound travels through walls. Uh, I think that I will probably end up causing myself some trouble here. Nope. Okay. Now we run through and get those gems. Um, it, the game does a really good job. It's kind of like a little bit of a, a buzz phrase in the, in the games industry, especially when it comes to critics like myself. But, you know, teaching without teaching. The levels are designed in such a way that there's like incremental progress uh, that happens um, I think we can do this. Uh, like, there's incremental progress in terms of, like, what you're learning, which is, uh, important. But I think every game strives to do something like that, most of the time at least. Um, this is one of the games that has done a, a really good job of succeeding at it. So I'm gonna put the oddity over here, and then I'm gonna whistle, and when this guy comes around, he should get attracted to it, and I have messed up miserably. This is going to highlight something that I think is a little bit... Oh, I'm gonna get shot. No, I'm not. I'm actually going to be able to make it to the exit. It highlights a little bit of what I would describe as um, an AI deficiency. Like, why don't we do that exact same level again, if this is the, it is the same level? Uh, yeah, it is. You can exploit the AI a little bit, and I think that this is actually a little bit of a design flaw if I may, you know, put on my completely amateur game designer hat. Even though I said that every level... I'm an idiot, and my analog stick is slightly off-center, so that caused me to walk there. But we'll pick up our oddity here. I want to make my point. Um, there's a... Uh, even though every level... I said it was like, kind of like a self-contained puzzle. It's actually a series of self-contained puzzles within the scope of an entire level. Like this area, before that checkpoint, which is that series of diamonds on the left side of your screen. That is like a... Um, that's basically a puzzle. How do I get by these guys? When I get by them, I hit that checkpoint. All enemies reset to their original positions and lose their aggro. So it's actually possible that maybe we could aggro these enemies and then run around them and just exploit their AI and look, they get distracted. Now I can just run past them. I mean, there's also, that's not even really the example I was gunning for. Check this out, what if I like, what if I aggro this guy? He gets aggroed towards me, but then I run through the checkpoint. He shoots me, I'm just gonna let him shoot me. But I've made it through the checkpoint, so the game's kinda like, ah, good enough. In a way, it's a good thing. It's kinda like a puzzle game where you have multiple solutions, uh, but it feels oddly cheap to do this, but because the game lets you do it, you also feel like, in order to set the best leaderboard times, like if I reset the entire level here, that's uh, just a reset checkpoint, but if I reset the entire level here, I grab the oddity, uh, and it takes me like four, uh, maybe like ten seconds to get to the point where I can shoot the oddity into a position to get by these enemies without them uh, being able to hit us, right? So I mean, look at the timer here, as I shoot it, I run past them, by the time I get to the first checkpoint, it's gonna be like almost twenty seconds. If I instead... I should probably still pick up the oddity, but if I instead just like trick them and then do a little bit of a run around. Oh, I did get shot there. It's gonna be a little bit more trial and error y, error -y obviously, but it's also like completely plausible that I still might be able to make it to that checkpoint. You can see I almost did it right there. It, probably with a few more attempts, I might have a shot at it. But I kind of feel like I have to do it in order to prove my point here. And if I don't do it, then I shouldn't get the credit for, for having come up with this as a criticism because it seems a little bit invalid. Um, but I hope that you can see what I'm saying. Look, there we go. We made it in 10 seconds there. And then this guy will pretty much do the same thing. We almost made it through to the second checkpoint in the amount of time it would take us to make it to the first checkpoint. So I really, I, I, I'll say it, I kind of dislike that the checkpoints reset enemy aggro. Because I think it leads to... Um, a, a completely viable playstyle that is a little bit less focused on uh, actually being stealthy and a little bit more focused on just kind of like trial and error until you uh, get to the... Like, this is going to fail miserably. So we've learned that we probably can't do that. But a little bit more focused on, um, on trial and error and kind of exploiting an AI that I would describe as a little bit too predictable, like a little bit too weak. Like, this, this actually just almost worked for us here as well. Um... I, I think that that does compromise the game somewhat, and you can just as easily say, well, if you don't want to play it that way, you don't have to play it that way. And that's true, but because it is, there's that timer, it incentivizes you, I think, like, psychologically, to be like, I want to beat the level quickly. So you actually have to have, like, a little bit of self-control and be like, no, I'm going to figure out the way to solve this puzzle the right way, I'm not just going to go with the solution that I can brute force. And uh, I, I think that, in a way, that does compromise the elegance of the game somewhat, um, which is unfortunate. Let's move on to a level that maybe we've not done, and you can hear a little bit more of the voice work here. Hopefully. I have the game volume turned pretty low. 
So you know what? I'm actually gonna I'm gonna alt tab here for a second because the voice work, like the story, is a principal element of the game. I would feel remiss if I didn't at least uh, you know give it give it a chance to shine here. So I'm gonna raise it slightly in the mixer, and hopefully if there's some actual exposition here, you can get a feel for how the voice work is. Because obviously, like, doing a video of Thomas Was Alone where you just, like, you know, mainline the puzzles would probably not have been that effective. All right. I guess. So I actually, uh, you know what, I started this level last night, but I don't think I finished it. Which means that I have probably, um, ruined my chance for exposition here. Good, they're both focused on that. Again, I can't stress enough that, you know, the, the visuals are not just a gimmick. Like, the visuals... We definitely need an oddity here. Um, the visuals are not just... Oh, they didn't see that. All right, I gotta wait for it to come back here. Uh, the visuals are not just a gimmick. Like, it's actually a, a principal element of the game that every level looks unique and stunning and kind of like, uh, you know, no other level in the game really looks like that. So I'd, I'd like this dude to get aggroed. Okay, good. We did get him on the oddity there. That was a little scary. Let's see what we've got. Uh, here we got a mute. Okay, the mute is actually a cool piece of technology. You can only have one piece of equipment at a time, at least in the amount of the game that I've played so far. What the mute allows you to do is, um, you, you get a sprinting ability. I've, I've seen people saying, like, well, where's the run ability in, in volume? Why are you always walking everywhere? Well, you, you do gain a sprint ability. It also makes it so you don't make any sound when you move, which is pretty valuable uh, when it comes to, to getting by situations like this one, where there's tiles on the ground that normally would cause you to, uh, to take, uh, or to, to make sound, I should say. The mute actually makes this area much, much easier, as you might expect. You could also do it with the oddity, I'm sure. And that's one of the things I like about it, is that there... Oh, God, what have I done? There are, like, multiple ways to solve problems. Um, and, and they're designed to be multiple ways to solve problems. I just don't like that one of the ways is kind of, like, rely on the guards being bad. Like, in this case, I was still just using the mute as a sprint that was basically able to beat the level. Am I wrong? Like... I, I don't want to I don't want to pick on that element of the game because I do think if you stop yourself from doing that it becomes a much stronger experience. But I also sort of feel like if I can do that, why wouldn't I? If Nick and I were talking on the the Roundtable podcast and he was saying like it feels like you're playing the game the wrong way when you do that. But it's also kind of fun to see how you break the game. Do you give the like how, how you can break the game to get the best amount of time? Is that or the least amount of time? I guess is that something you treat as a knock against the game? Because you, you feel like you're playing it the way it wasn't intended to be played? Or do you treat that as a positive because the game rewards multiple different playstyles? I don't know. It's, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting question to ask for sure. I do like the competitive aspect of it. Apparently, uh, the leaderboards might be a little bit bugged because I just set the world record time on that level with a time of minus one second. I don't know what, why I'm constantly having the bugged leaderboards positions. I'm sure people are going to look at this and be like, What's up with this fucking hacker, man? This guy's pretty- look at him sending, you know, bullshit client-side data to the leaderboards to try to cheese it. Minus one second? How's that even possible? Look, your guys is as good as mine, man. Why don't you replicate what I did? There you go. I, I went through a wormhole and came out on the other side. Um, alright, so we'll, we'll enter this level as well. Nice, uh, blue and orange kind of palette going on here. And we get introduced to a new enemy. These are dogs. Dogs have a much larger cone, um... I don't know what the problem with them is. Well, I guess we can read about it right here if we just wait. Hounds are pretty dangerous. Not directly. They can't hurt you directly, but they'll bring other enemies running. Okay, so, you know, there are there are patrol enemies that have, like, a standard vision cone and chase you down and hurt you. There are turrets that have a, um, a smaller... Or they have, like, a similar vision cone, but they shoot you much more quickly, but they can't chase you. Once you get outside of their, uh... Once you get outside of their vision, they will not uh, be able to, to find you. Oh man, I made it. Um, and then there are there are hounds that have like a, a large, like semicircular, 180 degree cone of vision, but uh, they don't actually hurt you directly. They just cause enemies to chase you down. By the way, I would like to point out. I think. That, oh, I just stood up to read that, and this guy got me. Uh, there's a lot of. Um... I no, you go ahead. Maybe I could lower the volume a little bit here. Sometimes it gets really, really loud. So this is what hounds can do, I guess, is that, you know, basically draw enemies towards you. But, um, there's a lot of, like, exposition in the game in the form of these, uh, these logs they'll read on the ground. That's something I haven't really commented on too much, because it's your mileage may vary. You know, it's kind of exposition 
disguised as ambient storytelling. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But it tells you kind of what's going on with the situation where Loxley is like, he's doing corporate espionage to try to take back Britain for the people, or England for the people, because the Gisborne Corporation has got like a, you know, surveilo dystopian kind of thing going on. Dave, hi, just saw the vid on the takeover, the future of artificial intelligence in the hands of the world's leading arms firm. Now there's a book I want the rights to. Must be exciting around the water cooler today. Have you met Guy yet? Seems like a serious operator. $100 says you can't make him crack a grin. Speaking of dollars, I have to send some your way. Got your cut of the paperback deal. Looks like your daughter's gonna get one hell of an education. Dude, with this check, you could put 100 daughters through college. So yeah, send me over those new bank details, my man. Put life instanced DU new bank details in the subject. So you, you slowly tease apart a little bit more of the uh, exposition that is not directly told through the voice acting. It's a shame that we have not seen, or heard, rather, a lot of the voice acting thus far, because the voice acting is pretty serviceably done. Uh, a lot of the discourse I've seen about the game is focused on the fact that, um, you know, the main character, voiced by Charlie is so cool, like, is maybe a, a little bit casual in his delivery. Um, We'll do another level here while we're talking. Uh, I, I don't disagree with that. His his feels kind of like weightless and, and, and breathy compared to the other characters in the game. But, I don't know. It sort of works. It's not, a, it's, not an enormous, uh, it's not an enormous problem for me. I'm seeing a bunch of glitches in the data for this environment. Sorry, uh, lots of objects in the wrong places. This is meant to be a house. Muddle through if you can. Alright. Um, I, I want to point out that it might seem... Oh, I've bunged it up miserably here. I'm sight reading this level, so I, I think there's some excuse there. Um, I want to point out that for all the things that I've said about volume that, that probably come across as negative, I actually think it's a solid game. Oh god. I was so close there. I actually think it's a solid game, and, and where it succeeds largely is on the... Um, okay, we're gonna have to make a move here. Playing, like, games where methodology is important and at the same time talking about them in what you hope is an intellectual way. Sorry, yes, no idea why that's up there. Alright, there's just a chair on the top there. Um, and talking about it at the same time. Surprisingly tricky. There's a checkpoint there for us. Um, the puzzles are really, really well designed, especially the first time you go through them when you're trying to actually solve them in the, uh, the intended way. That's, oh god, that's really, really fun and, uh, you can tell that the game comes from a, like, a well-designed designed perspective, if that makes sense. Like, the puzzles are deliberate. They're not just puzzles that have been kind of thrown in there to be like, ah, just give them another one. Just give them another one. Like, every puzzle tries to um, iterate on what it's taught you or or teach you something new, which I think is cool. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the... Oh, Jesus. One of the principal focuses of that here is that there's a, a new enemy type. But anyway, uh, I just... In a way, I almost feel like the game is a little bit of a victim of hype. And it's not really fair to say that. It's, it's, a, it's a more nuanced discussion than I'd like to have here. It, but Volume was like a really, really hyped game, and again, this is another thing we talked about on the Roundtable podcast this week. When I think about why it's a hyped game, I'm kind of like, I, I can't really come up with good reasons. Which is not to say that Thomas Was Alone is not a good game, which it is. It's just, I'm, I'm surprised that, um, you know, Volume has kind of become, I, I don't want to say a killer app necessarily or something like that. But I'm kind of surprised that Volume has taken on this perspective of like, oh, this is going to be like a, a a very, very important, and it sounds almost a little bit rude, but like this is going to be a major release of the summer. What it actually is, is like a pretty small stealth game that's got good mechanics. It's a little uneven in some elements, and you know, I, apart from the visuals, I don't know if it's necessarily something that I would consider a, an enormous standout, but it's a... Uh, it, it kind of collapses under the weight of the hype, which is not fair. At the same time, I didn't create the hype, you know, you didn't create the hype, the hype is created, you know, by the press, well I guess I, I have a hand in that as well, I can't just wash my hands completely of that. But, um, also, like, the the people coming out with the game, but of course they're gonna try to hype the game. It's not like they're, they, they've lied about anything. Overload force field, this is the first time I've seen this actually. It's not like they lied about anything in the release of the game, it was just like, you know, Thomas Was Alone Man is making a new game. Thomas Was Alone was good. I'm excited to play this. This is Andy Serkis. I ruined his voice work accidentally. I was particularly saddened to hear today of a child with a camera. 
instead of contributing to his country, has decided to do it damage. In the weeks, months, and years after the revolution, while we were working to put this country back together, rebuilding it into something solid, something safe from the sins of our past, did we stop to steal from one another? Did we selfishly plot to hurt others for our own gain? The world is hard. The challenges ahead of us are real and dangerous. There are no shortcuts. The world is hard. The challenges ahead of us are real and dangerous. There are no shortcuts. No matter what they... Oh my god. Well, at the very least, we got to hear a little Andy Circus, And this also provides us with... Um, Another thing that, if I may say so, I'd like to complain about a little bit. The the game's story is mostly told through exposition, which is, like, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, we basically made it, and then fucked it, and then made it, and then fucked it, and then fucked it. We're still, oh, we made it. Disable the force field. No, we're going to get shot as we're doing that. That's okay. This seems like a bit of a tricky positional puzzle. But the, um, is there, like, any safe spot? Like, if I... No, they turn to the left. Okay, so we want to be, like, on the right of them if we can do this. But anyway, let me post up here for a second as I make my point. Since the story is told through exposition, prepare on this trial and error kind of stuff to hear yourself say, or hear, not yourself, sorry, hear the game say the same things over and over and over. Um, which is a real problem. Like, anytime you get interrupted, the dialogue starts from the beginning of that specific, uh, like, passage. Uh, anytime you die, it's going to start from where you were. It, it just is a little bit, like... Whatever the opposite of seamless is, it's full of seams. Like, you are you are constantly going to hear a lot of the same similar dialogue. Not even similar, like literally the same dialogue. Over and over. We actually made it through there. Which is not to say that it's bad, you know? It's an ambitious way to tell a story. It's just sometimes I don't think it's integrated uh, fully perfectly. So this is like a super weird, let's look at it. Let's also talk about the other features that we have going on here. Mostly the, the thing that you're going to be interested in is this uh, level editor. So you can use the level editor to create levels. You know, this will create, like, knee-high walls. You can't vault over them. And then if we go, like, a little bit higher, we can create walls that uh, are, like, structural and then walls that we can use as uh, as cover when we're standing up, I guess. So, you know, I've never used the level editor. I, I am not really the kind of guy who's super interested in using the level editor, despite me putting on my, my game designy hat earlier. Uh, but it, it seems fine, but it's the kind of thing that I'm, I've never really uh, uh, been particularly interested in. Um... We need to add a, uh, was add a target onto the level. I actually don't even know where that comes from. So I'm not going to sit here and, like, bullshit you and be like, well, this is, you know, the first time I've ever used the level editor, but let me, uh, describe to you how important it is for me to, you know, blah, blah, blah. We can add some flavor text. Not even text, dude, like, flavor stuff here. There you go, a bookshelf on top of the table. Um... Yeah, I've never used the level editor. Your mileage may vary. I don't use level editors in games. It's cool that there is a way for there to be more levels. And I believe that if we actually look at uh, online, there should be some levels in there right now. And there is uh, a bit of a grading system, I think, that allows us to, to see how they're doing. Be patient. I'm not trying to make fun of it. I'm just pointing it out. Um, yeah, you can create your own levels there. I believe that might be the reviewer for... GameSpot, Mike Mahardy, but anyway. There's also some staff picks in here uh, that have come in. We'll see how that gets curated. Anyway, this is volume. It's it's a weird let's look at in that I feel like I've said a lot of negative things, but I'm overall positive on the game. It's one of the, it occupies that weird middle ground of a game that is good, but probably falls a little bit short of greatness in ways that are easy to articulate. Isn't it? Like, I think this, this is a solid, like, 7 out of 10 game. The things that keep it from being a 9 out of 10 for me personally are just the kind of things that are easy to articulate. It's not a let's look at where I went into it being like, Hey, you know, I don't know why this isn't my favorite game of the year, but I only feel okay about it. Like, I feel like I did, I've done a pretty good job explaining why there are some things in here that I'm not a particular uh, fan of. I don't think it's perfect, uh, and the campaign seems to be relatively short. I mean, you can run the math here for yourself. Admittedly, most of these, like, first levels I wasn't sight reading because I'd already played them in the, the preview that I did, but we're about a quarter of the way through the story at roughly an hour and a half. So you're looking at, like, a six-hour long game, maybe five if you're better at stealth stuff on sight read than I am. Um, but it's not really about how much content there is in the game. I think it's about the experience that you enjoy 
or whether or not you enjoy the experience as you're playing it. A lot of that is going to depend on how you feel about the mechanics, a lot of that is going to depend on how you feel about the story, and unfortunately, some of that stuff is, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, for me personally, like the mechanics, a little bit, you know, 50-50, I'm doing the thing where you put your hand in the air and then kind of shake it back and forth, like, eh, it's like, you know, some good, some bad, come see, come saw. But anyway, uh, I do think volume is pretty good. The one thing I will say is that I do feel like this was overhyped, and I don't mean it as like a fuck you PR, you know, you lied to us. You're never gonna get me again. I mean it more like, if you have the concept, or you have it in your head, the, the context of this being the second game designed by the guy who made Thomas Was Alone, that gives you a much uh, better idea of the scope of volume, in my opinion, than if you have this idea of like, oh my god, it's the second game from English genius Mike Bithel, and I, I hope that if he's watching, he doesn't take offense to that. I'm not saying he's not a genius, but it was like the difference between like, it's the second game from a guy who made a pretty good game, versus like, this is going to, you know, to summer 2015, this is going to change your life. If you put it within the context of it being uh, an ambitious but still relatively small stealth game with really solid mechanics, it's more of a stealth puzzle game than like a stealth action or stealth platformer, obviously just like not a stealth platformer then I think you're, you're set up to have a more fun time with the game than if you went in thinking this is like you know the Empire Strikes Back or something like that I hope I've done a good job of articulating that uh, I do want to point out again in case you skipped the first part of the video for whatever reason maybe you hate that I have a tendency to ramble um, Mike Bithel and I are again friends uh, we have we have had personal relations with what that sounds like We've had sexual intercourse. We have not, but uh, we, we, you know, we've hung out a couple of times in, in a non-professional context. Um, so if that compromises my opinion on the game, that's fine. You know, that's your that's your right as a viewer and a consumer to, to go seek out opinion elsewhere. I think I've done a pretty good job of, of providing a, a fair and balanced opinion of how I feel about the game, and uh, I hope that you feel the same way too. You know, I, I did this honestly with with full disclosure because I have nothing to hide with my relationship with Mike. Um, if you uh, if you enjoyed the episode, click the like button. It helps out a great deal. And of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. And of course, volume is available. Uh, you can check out the link in the video description below to pick it up on Steam. It's $22 Canadian after its opening week sale is over, which means uh, probably 18 or 20 US. With the falling Canadian dollar, it's fallen like 30% year over year. I actually don't know. <laughs> where how the how the currencies are pegged compared to one another on Steam, but yeah, eighteen to twenty dollars US on the store. Is it worth it? You'll have to decide for yourself. Uh, a lot of good stuff going on here, a lot of uneven stuff. Mostly, I think it ends up being a positive experience. Again, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the episode, and I'll see you next time.